percent battery. Um, Gerard has gone bananas. Gerard's gone crazy. He shaved his beard. He he killed Bradley just on a whim. I don't know what to do. This this is the only place I can find. I. Oh my god. Oh my god. Uh, oh my god. No, no, uh, uh, it, everyone, mom, no, ah, ah. <laughs> What do we got here? It's one of them cameras, huh? <laughs> Family son. <laughs> oh wait, hold on. Oh shit, this is Snapchat. Ah oh, crap. It's a Snapchat. Oh no, I gotta stop the video. Yes. Hey everyone, welcome to a brand new episode of The Completionist. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not on my set, and we've got construction going on in our offices to make it all nice and soundproof for when we have other guests and tenants here in the office. So unfortunately, I don't have a set, I also don't have a beard anymore, and yeah, how's your Friday going? I hope it's going great so far. In less than a few days, Resident Evil 7 is out, and I know you guys are gonna play it. I know I wanna play it. I am waiting for my copy. Waiting for my copy. It's almost here. But in the meantime, as you guys know, I like to do things in order, and so, in terms of the completionists in our show, we are going in order from what we've done in the Resident Evil franchise so far. So, we've done RE1. We've done RE2. We've done RE3. We have RE0 still remaining, uh, RE4, 5, 6, and then 7, and I'm sure some other indie titles in between. Uh, but today, we're going to actually play one of my favorite games on the Dreamcast, well, the port of it at least. And that game is Resident Evil Code Veronica. Yeah, I can't stand this, this song anymore. We're almost, almost there. Ah, Code Veronica, the oft-overlooked weird kid in the Resident Evil family. Everybody has warm, fuzzy memories of their first trip through the Spencer Mansion, and RE4 won enough awards to be able to dive into Scrooge McDuck style. But from the get-go, poor Code Veronica had the odds stacked against it. See, it was originally the rightful heir to the mainline Resident Evil crown, but it was passed over in favor of its sibling, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. What we now know as Resident Evil 3 started off as a low-cost side story to Resident Evil 2, which is pretty obvious when you notice the reused assets, recycled environments, and the general lack of advancement to the engine. Now don't get me wrong, Nemesis is tight, it's one of my favorites, but let's not fool ourselves into thinking that it wouldn't just be DLC for Resident Evil 2, but when Big Bad Sony demanded that the next Resident Evil game released on their console must be a mainline title, Nemesis was then rebranded as Resident Evil 3. To make matters worse, Code Veronica was released exclusively for the Sega Dreamcast, which didn't exactly set the world on fire commercially. By the time it released in the year 2000, Code Veronica went from the next big thing to something that felt more like Resident Evil Gaiden. No, no, nope, not that one, no, fuck that game, that sh looks terrible, get off the screen, there we go, thank you. And despite going on to sell millions of copies and earning widespread positive reviews, Code Veronica remains relatively obscure compared to its peers. Well, that ends right here, right now. Now is the time for the underdogs of video game franchises. Those without a voice will be heard today. Rise up, Metal Gear Ghost Babble. Arise, Cannon Spike. Shout and tremble the heavens, Mega Man the Power battles. Hey, fuck off, Resident Evil Gaiden, you're too terrible to save. Get off the screen. Go. Get out of here. Get. 
So today, I'll be completing the re-release of Code Veronica known as Code Veronica X on the PlayStation 2, which was released on PS2 in 2001 with GameCube and Xbox ports soon after. It features improved graphics and added cutscenes. You know, the stuff that's most important in video games. These Resident Evil games give you grades based on your performance once you beat them, which means that I'll eventually have to shoot for an A. And if you've seen here on the show previously, we do everything and we go for those goddamn A rankings no matter what. But when it comes to Code Veronica, I'm not crazy enough to go in for it on my first try. Once I've become nice and acquainted with the game's puzzles, traps, and undead nightmare creatures, I'll go for the goal. But still, getting that A is going to be tough since your final grade is based on how quickly you finish, how many first aid sprays you use, and how often you save your game. So basically, the game is encouraging me to rush through things without healing myself and never saving my progress. This is not going to end well, but fuck it. Let's go. Okay. That's, those are the stakes. Welcome to the show. I don't even want to fucking think about what it would be like to play through most of the game without ever saving, only to get dropped by some random ass late game zombie that gets lucky and grabs me while I'm turning a corner and just boom, snaps the neck or some shit. That's the kind of rage that will make you rip your PlayStation out the wall and throw it at an intern named Bradley, Bradley. But that's the worst case scenario. I'm actually looking forward to revisiting a Resident Evil game from a simpler time. You know, before hillbilly families crash through walls to chase us. Although I'm super excited for that. Resident Evil 7 is so close. Give me that game. I guarantee that nothing in this game can be as terrifying as that. Like, what's the worst thing this game has to offer? Uh, there's this thing right here. <laughs> what the hell is that thing? It's, it's apparently an albinoid. An albinoid? It looks like a lizard without a head. Why would I be afraid of something that's dumb enough to lose its head? It's, it's, it's got electric power. I don't care if its name is goddamn Pikachu. At least it's cute. I want to pet one. I want to keep it around the office. You know how some characters are like obsessed with making themselves perfect and they end up experimenting on themselves? At first, they look all godlike and buff, but then they morph out of control and end up looking like a walking tumor? That's Resident Evil Code Veronica. There's actually some impressive features in this game that improve the series as a whole, but there are also bizarre choices all over the place that don't really hurt the experience, but will leave you wondering just what the hell the developers were thinking. And I know we're talking about a franchise that's featured stuff like giant spiders and painting puzzles from the get-go, but sometimes Code Veronica just gets... Weird, man. Our story begins only three months after Claire Redfield narrowly escaped from the fires of Raccoon City. But she apparently doesn't care that much about her own safety because she's searching for her brother, Chris Redfield, in one of Umbrella Corporation's secret European labs. Nothing's more sinister than... Europe. Your European labs. European labradoodles, they're all terrifying. Claire manages to dodge an inhuman number of bullets and pull off some Matrix-esque moves that leave you scratching your head. But she's ultimately captured and thrown into a prison facility on one of Umbrella's many private islands. But just after she arrives, the island gets attacked by a mysterious source. This basically gives Claire's prison guard a major case of I don't give a damn, and so he lets her go free. And waiting outside for her are a bunch of extremely naked zombies, reanimated by yet another outbreak of the T-Virus. Surprise, surprise. The rest is business as usual. Scary monsters, sinister plots, and gotta escape to safety while racing against the self-destruction sequence. Is the premise merely another strange sequence of events designed to drop a young lady into the middle of a zombie-themed emergency? Yes. Are the plot, characters, and dialogue all thin and laughably dubious? <laughs> all the better for me. Of course, this is Resident Evil. But is the game a good time? Oh, most definitely. All of the old, familiar tropes of the series are alive and well within Code Veronica, and they're all still wonderful. But they've all received little twists here and there that make them seem so much more... Weird, man. 
Instead of starting off in a seemingly benign location, Code Veronica begins right in the heart of Umbrella territory. Instead of being trapped within an interior location, in Code Veronica, you spend a good amount of time outside pretty early on. And while you still got an opposite gendered sidekick in this game, Steve Burnside takes the cake as the most out of place and irritating partner in Resident Evil history. Everything he says sounds like he's whining. Don't worry, Claire. Your knight in shining armor is here. He's inexplicably cavalier about the whole biohazard outbreak thing. And worst of all, the game is constantly trying to make us care about him. Does anyone seriously give a damn about this kid? I sure as hell don't. Why haven't any of Resident Evil's main characters gotten this much development? Like Claire! She's right there! She's right fucking there! Tell us about her! I want to know more about her, or Leon, or Chris! I fucking hate Steve! You know what? We've been digging into Steve Buscemi on the show forever now, but we're retiring Buscemi. From now on, Steve is the new Steve. You hear that, Steve? Let's try it out. Kiss my ass, Steve. Yeah, that works. Code Veronica came out two years before the first Resident Evil movie, and a whole four years before the series' most drastic tonal shift, Resident Evil 4. But even here, you can clearly recognize the subtle transition from pure horror to action. The writing is on the wall. The game's opening cinema is like a John Woo film. The locales are far more exotic, and they're sh** like this. Ah, oh, go to hell, Steve. Look, I'm not trying to reignite the old Cold War between spooky RE fans versus action RE fans. I'm just pointing out that you can definitely feel Code Veronica leaning even further towards the louder end of the scale. But that's not to say that this game isn't fucking scary. At times, it's disturbing. Now we've got torture devices and look, fucking creepy ass dolls. Nobody likes those. And the freakiest, most eerie thing that Code Veronica brings to the table are its main antagonists, the Ashford Twins. They're evil, they're exceedingly aristocratic, and they're like, way too blonde for me. Oh, and they seem to be really into each other. I feel like I need a bath. Yeah, this game gets dark, and I don't even mean metaphorically. This game is literally dark as hell. At first, I thought I had accidentally turned the brightness down to the game settings, but nope. Turns out that you can't change the brightness at all. There were times when I was playing and I couldn't see anything at all. Where the hell am I? Last week we were playing the brightest game ever, and this week we're playing the darkest game ever. But when you consider the changes to the lighter item in Code Veronica, the darkness seems like it could possibly be intentional. Instead of being relegated to just puzzles, you can use the lighter to dynamically light dark areas by equipping it. It's a shame because the game looks great. The character models are far less blocky, the backgrounds are now rendered in real time as opposed to the pre-rendered pictures of the past. And the camera actually moves dynamically now! The angles will switch along with the player's movements instead of just cutting from one to another. Ooh, let's see that again! Fancy. The static angles in early Resident Evil games always helped to ensure that players saw just what the designers intended, and the camera's new freedom of movement only helps that. Code Veronica is delightfully creepy, and it's definitely classic Resident Evil all over again. And yet, it also stands apart from the rest of the series due to how many odd choices it makes. In hindsight, they seem like the symptoms of a burgeoning metamorphosis of the franchise, like a chrysalis before evolving into the butterfly that was Resident Evil 4. And at the end of the day, it's got plenty of imagery that'll stay with you, whether you like it or not, like those damn Ashford twins. With all the changes that Capcom made to the usual Resident Evil aesthetics with Code Veronica, you'd think they'd change the gameplay up too, but no. This game plays just like the ones before it. Eh, sure, there are a few unique qualities here and there, but we're still shooting at the undead, we're still scavenging for supplies with tank controls, and we still haven't reached the point where the puzzles are replaced by boulder punching. Not quite, but we're almost there. 
Just like in older Resident Evils, Code Veronica lets you play as multiple characters, namely the Redfield kids, Claire and Chris. But instead of having their own separate campaigns, they share a single one, with Chris taking over for Claire about halfway through the game. That's cool and all, but I miss the uniqueness and replayability of the A and B scenarios from Resident Evil 2. But at least you get to revisit some of Claire's areas as Chris later on. It's always fascinating to witness events under different circumstances, or to have to solve puzzles across two different characters. And for a survival horror game, Code Veronica seems to be really generous with its items. I felt like there was health and ammo all over the place. Maybe I've just gotten better at managing my resources since my last rodeo, but I always had enough firepower to deal with problems, and there were only a handful of instances where I was truly hurting for an herb or two. In general, this game seems a bit more lenient on its difficulty. For example, both Claire and Chris get access to side packs very early on in their respective sections, increasing their inventory space from 8 slots to 10. That kind of power-up is usually reserved for way later in the game. You know those powerful, non-reloadable weapons that you use up and then you ditch forever? Well, those are all over this game. It's like Code Veronica wants to make sure that I'm safe from all of the monsters. Capcom, it's okay. I've played three of these. I can take care of myself. I'm a big boy now. Speaking of monsters, RE's regular starting lineup of infected freaks all make their return. You've got your zombies, your Cerberuses, hunters, and big-ass spiders. But there are also a few newcomers that make Code Veronica's roster a little bit more unique. Like the Bandersnatches, which are these huge flesh-colored lumps of ugly that have one giant arm and one little itty bitty arm. Guess which one is more dangerous? They can bust a Stretch Armstrong to attack you from afar or rush you down. Plus, they look like that one human xenomorph hybrid from Alien Resurrection. And then there's the best part of the whole game, the Monster Moth Hallway. See, there are these giant moths that only appear in this hallway in the entire game. They're easy enough to take out, sure, but if they land on you, they'll lay an egg on your back. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds fucking gross. When the eggs hatch, the larva will bite into you, potentially poisoning you. Now, there's a planter that contains infinite blue herbs to heal you of your poison status right in the hallway. The problem is that the moth eggs seem to have no discernible incubation period. Sometimes they'll hatch instantly, and other times they won't hatch until you leave the room. Oh, and did I mention that if you do leave the room, all of the moths respawn, meaning that you'll probably get egged again if you come back to heal? It's a fucked up cycle of get egged, leave, come back to heal, get egged. I did this for eight minutes straight. Avoid the monster moth hallway, please. And of course, they're the albinoids. You only encounter one adult albinoid the entire game, and you don't even have to fight it. You just gotta wade up to the item, grab it, and run your ass off before you get shocked to death. But there is one point where a bunch of baby albinoids will swarm you and try to kill you. But they're just so damn cute. Things got pretty stressful when going for that A rating on my second playthrough. Even though I had basically memorized item locations and was following a guide just in case. Little mistakes like accidentally running into a wall while turning a corner or getting grabbed by a ghoulie start to wear on you when you know that every second counts. But ultimately, Code Veronica is a simple and relaxing time that's still compelling to play. Things may feel extremely familiar to longtime fans of the series, but all the things that made the first Resident Evil's great are still here. Back in 2000, the formula may have been wearing a little thin, sure, but after the more recent couple of Resident Evil games, Code Veronica feels genuinely refreshing. I know it's a shadowy fortress that's infested with monsters and controlled by a sinister pharmaceutical corporation, but my time on Rockford Island was rather enjoyable. Rockford Island, you would get four stars on Yelp, but not five, because of Steve. If you were worried that all of the effort you have to put into getting an A ranking would get you nothing in return, well then fret not. You do get something and it's badass. 
a rocket launcher with infinite ammo that's capable of one-shotting just about everyone in the game. Sure, by the time you get it, you've probably beaten the game a few times and are getting bored with it, and that kind of happens over and over again in these games, but come on, look at this thing! Nothing feels more cathartic than returning to the home of your oppressors and striking fear into their hearts by whipping out a weapon of mass destruction! But that's not all. Beating the game will also unlock battle mode, the action-oriented minigame that's become something of a tradition in Resident Evil post games. Battle mode's got no connection with the main campaign, and many of the rules are completely different. And in Code Veronica, you can completely play it in first-person mode, which is pretty damn disorienting. Thank God Capcom's ironed out the bugs in the past 17 years. The goal of this mode is to fight your way through room after room of enemies, and ultimately take out a boss in the shortest amount of time possible. Things are far more arcadey than in the campaign. Each round is pretty brief and you have access to weapons with infinite ammo. You even get to play as a bunch of characters, including Chris, two different versions of Claire, punk-ass Steve, and Albert Wesker. They each come with personalized arsenals, which end up making them play pretty differently from one another. Yet, not every character is unlocked from the start. You can get alternate Claire by beating battle mode with original Claire, and Wesker can be unlocked by beating it with Chris. And if for some weird ass reason you actually want to play as Steve, you can unlock him by completing the drawer puzzle in the main game, grabbing the replica Luger item and placing it into the item box. Even here in battle mode, you're given a grade based on your performance, and getting an A is purely based on your finishing time. Doing well in this mode is all about assessing rooms quickly and figuring out the most efficient way to dispatch everyone. It's a fun little diversion that's at least worth trying out simply due to the fact that you get to walk around with the magnum and infinite ammo. I wish I could say that battle mode is all fun and games, because it's not. Beating it with Wesker is an absolute drudge. Why? Because while every other character has access to an armory's worth of firepower, all that's left for Wesker, you guys know him, one of the generals of the Umbrella Corporation and superpowered arch villain, is a knife. I mean, I guess it makes sense. Wesker doesn't really need weapons to take out his enemies, but it does make his battle mode run simply ridiculous. Thankfully, Wesker's time limit for an A is really large, so you only have to worry about staying alive. But what sucks the most is the RNG aspect of battle mode. See, in one particular room during each run, there's a slot machine that will either hold a powerful weapon for your specific character, or a diary item that's basically a thank you for playing, try again message to the player. Just imagine having to take down Wesker's boss with a combat knife. Entire, well-executed runs with Wesker have ended in tragedy, all because of <laughs> the jokes on me. I got the gag item instead of the magnum that would take out the boss in less than six shots. We get it, Wesker. You're a badass. But next time, you bring a fucking gun, or you make like like a big ass arm come at the back of your neck and kill someone. Cause god damn it. And your reward for earning A's with every character in battle mode is yet another launcher. Now this one's called the linear launcher and can only be used in battle mode. This is the linear launcher you get at the end of the game during the final boss fight. It fires some kind of blue plasma that vaporizes bad guys in one hit. I'm sensing a theme here. In my completion run of Code Veronica X, there were 20 hours of total playtime, two full campaign playthroughs, 24 deaths, 22 ink ribbons used, and one apology letter written to Steve Buscemi about ripping into him for the past couple of years. Steve, I know you're not watching, but just know that you're an incredible actor and that uh, you, you're you probably some of the best aspect of Adam Sandler films, and I'm glad that you're not doing that anymore. Boardwalk Empire is great. Thank you for that. Resident Evil Code Veronica is a short and sweet experience that even manages to reward players for their time. The main campaign more than stands up to the standards set by its predecessors, and the battle mode is an enjoyable diversion that significantly bumps the replayability up. It may not be a mainline title, but Code Veronica is just as worthy of praise as any other game in the franchise. Resident Evil Code Veronica is one of my more 
favorite Resident Evils. It feels like a secret gem that no one's experienced, and when I get to talk about Resident Evil, I kind of go to my friends and say, you have to play Code Veronica. If you loved the classic stuff, you've got to play Code Veronica. Now, if you look at what's out there now with Resident Evil HD Remake and Resident Evil Zero HD Remake, it obviously doesn't hold up nearly as well. But in regards to story, in regards to conflict, in regards to the graphics for what they were on the PS2, the Cube, and the Dreamcast, and the overall presentation, this one smokes 1, 2, and 3 right out of the water. Smokes them out of the water, blows them out of the water. Either way, some smoke is happening. Code Veronica tends to trim the fat that comes with RE1, 2, and 3 in regards to all of the rankings and all of the extra modes, which I really appreciated. However, once again, the entire completing for A ranking, S ranking situation doesn't make the journey worth it. Look, I love me some rocket launches. Just not necessary for this journey. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of finish it. Finish it! That's all the time we have for today, guys. So, please, as always, let me know what about today's episode somewhere on the internet. Resident Evil 7 is right around the corner. How hype are you? I'm super hype. It's gonna be good. Also, Resident Evil the final chapter movies coming out. I'm gonna go see it. I'm gonna go see it. Why not? Why not? I appreciate all forms of art. Now if you excuse me, here is the struggle of the Mothman Chronicles. I, that's a, that was a movie. I was more or less talking about the Moth Hallway, but you take you take whatever you interpret from this. Guys, this episode just came out in the morning. We haven't stopped completing the game. We're all tired. <laughs>